everyone. This is Buzzer Beaters, week number two, actually episode number two. And for those of you who have watched our first episode, you probably recognized that it's been a couple of weeks since we've been on here. And, you know, our intent is to do this every week. Uh, but unfortunately, life gets in the way sometimes, right? So, you know, spring break happened for my, my family last week. We actually had to go to a wedding in Seattle. And the wedding actually was on a Wednesday. The first time I've ever been on to a wedding on a Wednesday. And then my daughter, uh, you know, got accepted to Loyola Marymount. And that's probably where she's going to decide to go. And, uh, you know, my, my, my retirement plans have definitely changed because of how expensive <laughs> that freaking school is. Right. So, but anyway, you know, ha- you know, happy wife, happy daughter, happy, li- happy life. Right. You know, the, you know, the drill, Twan, cause you got, you got two girls and, and, and a wife too. So you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so, yeah. um, but uh, yeah, how was your week, Tuan? How, how, how did it go for you? Uh, yeah, it was the same thing. Life was in the way. Had to go to L.A. Uh, daughters had a concert down in L.A. Uh, wife was in New York for a little bit for a business trip. Uh, oh, so okay. yeah, yeah. So we were down in L.A., drove down there, drove back, uh, just trying to settle in, starting a new job. So there's a oh, lot going oh, on in my on. life right now. But uh, Absolutely, yeah, yeah, I'm excited man. to be on today. Uh, good, you know, excited stuff, to talk man. hoops. Watched a little Absolutely. bit That's... of the uh, of the championship game last night. You know, Absolutely. Uh, if we yeah, have time, we watched a little of that uh, Draymond Green podcast with uh, Oh yeah, uh, Dave yeah we... on there. So I know that's not on the agenda for today, but if we get a minute or two, we can Absolutely. touch on that. So definitely, so, yeah, let's yeah. talk about it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so anyway, for for the audience, uh, you know, if this is your first time listening to us, Anthony and I go way back. We're actually high school friends. Um, so that takes us, you know, 34 or five years ago. It's been a long time. And, uh, you know, we, we played basketball together. We went to, to, to rival high schools. Um, we are both Latinos, <laughs> yes. you know, and, uh, you know, we and love born, we, we, and we, both we born to, and raised in San Francisco. In San Francisco, yeah, we're both born and raised in San Francisco. So we're like Golden State Warriors fans yep. through and through. And, yep. you know, we're missing the game right now. Luckily, we have, you know, TiVo to record it. But we're missing the game so that we can bring you this content. So, but for the audience, uh, but Buzzer Beaters is a property of, uh, of, of gremlingsmedia.com. Uh, you can find this podcast on uh, gremlingsmedia.com, Rumble, YouTube, under the profile Gremlings Media, as well as your, your traditional podcast outlets such as Spotify, Google, and Apple. And uh, also the other podcast that's very popular uh, uh, from gremlingsmedia.com that's also a sports related uh, uh, has sports related content is points on the board so that's that was one that I used to do with William uh, now he's spun that off and is doing it on his own and now Anthony and I or Tuan you heard me call him Tuan that's my nickname for Anthony uh, we're we are going we do this every week like I said our intent is to do this every week and the format of, of the show is that we're going to go ahead and pick two topics each week each week, each of us are going to pick two topics and then we're going to play host for those topics. So what you're going to hear about today is my two topics are, of course, we you just brushed upon it, uh, Tuan, is that the, the title game, the NCAA title game happened last night. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, you know, our thoughts and the observations of the game, some of the key matchups, you know, some of the NBA potential caliber players that we observed in that game. If we think they're going to be a star, a rotation player, bench warmer, whatever, right? So that's the first topic we're going to talk about. And then the second thing is, you know, Nick, this is the last week of the NBA regular season. So we now know that the playoffs and the play-ins are pretty much set. But we don't know is where they're going to be seated. So that's the next thing that we're going to talk about. And then, Tuan, yeah, maybe you can talk about what you're going to – what you want to yeah, talk yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. So I teased it a little bit on our last podcast. Uh, one of the ones is a article from a site called Fade Away Worlds. Um, they basically created a pyramid, and we'll go over it a little bit. And they they – made their predict not predictions i guess they evaluated who they thought were the most skilled players on the pyramid um there's a total of about uh i want to say 25 30 players on there i don't know if we're going to touch on all of them but we'll kind of go through them because it's an interesting topic it's something eddie and i and for those of you that don't know you know eddie and i are friends like you mentioned uh we go to lunch we sync up so every time we're together we're always talking hoops if the niners are on fire like they have been the last couple years we'll talk a little bit of football as well but it's primarily around hoops um, and so that topic, we're going to get into that because I've I've always had a strong position on size is not a skill. Right. <laughs> you know, skill yep. is a skill. Uh, yep. 
but but we'll get on that a little bit. And then the other one was I wanted to talk about the triple double a little bit. Um, you know, Jokic is uh, currently the triple double machine. Um, kind of looked up some stats on you know who leads that, and you know what is the what is the impact of the triple double today? Um, what does it mean in terms of greatness for the players? You know, Russell Westbrook is the, is the leader, and I'm kind of you know uh, leading the witness here a little bit. But you know, Russell Westbrook is the leader on triple doubles. What does that mean towards his career? Does it matter? Does it is there an impact? Those type of things. So looking forward to having those conversations. All right, great. And and just to set the stage, our intent is to bring a maximum of fifteen minutes. 15 minutes for each of these four topics. So about an hour's worth of content is what we're planning to do. Sometimes we might go a little bit over, sometimes we might go a little under, but uh, we definitely like to invite you, for those of you listening, uh, to give us feedback. Uh, tell us some of the topics that you thought were good, some of the things that you probably don't, can do without, uh, what are some of the things you'd like for us to talk about in a future yeah. session. So for those of you who have the ability to put a comment uh, through your, uh, your platform, please do so, we invite that. So let's go ahead and get started here. So. So, 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 Twan, you saw the game last night, right? I um, did. I you know, it was uh, it was essentially the Zach Eady show for Purdue, and then you know, uh, UConn. You know, they just had a game plan to just have Zach Zach Eady beat them as much as they can because they know they he can't score seventy five points on his own, which is what you know UConn did to win the game. They scored seventy five points, yeah. uh, and then you know, of course, uh, Purdue scored sixty points, but. You know, Zach Eady is definitely a very dominant college player. We saw that. But, you know, it looked like a heavyweight fight in the very beginning. They, they definitely were feeling each other out. I thought they both teams were playing pretty damn well in the very beginning. But, you know, what I saw is that UConn, they, they, they play like a pro game, man. I mean, a lot of movement. It reminds me of the Warriors, the way that they were moving the ball. Um, and a lot of cutting and slashing. I mean, it, you know, it's interesting that, you know, the commentators are talking about, like, you know, how – difficult it would have been to really pick an MVP for that because everybody did their job and did it well. There's nobody who really, really stood out on the UConn side, whereas you can see if Purdue won, Zach Eade was going to be the MVP. It was pretty evident that it was their game plan to have him, you know, dominate as much as he can and kick the ball out. So that's what I observed. What about you, Tuan? What did you see? Yeah, well, what I saw was, you know, uh, Edie. It was the Edie show, but UConn had something that a lot of other teams don't have, and that's that Klingon guy. He's he's a pretty big fella, so he can hold his own, which allowed what I think is what basically UConn decided to do is, hey, uh, you know, Edie, have have a game. We're gonna not right. double you for the most part while Klingon's in there, and we're gonna let we're gonna see if the other guys can beat us. And clearly, the other guys couldn't. Um, I agree with you. They they had a solid game plan. You know, uh, they got a Hurley there as a coach, you know, Bobby yep. Hurley, which we grew up watching, uh, yep. you know, uh, his dad, senior, you know, uh, I'm familiar the with coach. him as well. Uh, yep. So, you know, they, they did have a game plan. I I enjoyed it. Actually, the, the guy, Newton, uh, stuck out to me. I thought he yeah, had he did. A, a, a better game than most. I believe Castle's a freshman. He He was a little more timid. You could tell he got skills. But the one thing that stood out to me, and I, you know, one thing that you know, I think we're going to talk about is I like at least Edie, you know, Clayton. I don't even know if he's going to, you know, he's probably projected in the first round. I don't know, but they're so yes. slow. They are so, just so yeah. slow for the NBA yep. game. I, I can't see them being starters in the NBA game. Uh, they're just, and you know, and especially, um, you know, a, a ZD or Edie's going to face big bodies. You know, the Jokic's the. You know, the, the, the guys like that. Embiid. Gonna, Embiid. Uh, yep. Embiid, Embiid. Uh, you know, you name them. I mean, Sue, some of the older Rudy guys. Well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, and he was getting frustrated. You know, you could tell he was getting frustrated. I actually thought a couple times in the low post, he got away with tossing some elbows. You know, he was yep, kind of trying sure. to clear people out. You can you can tell he was getting a little frustrated. But the Newton Newton was the guy that stood out to me. I I, I kind of he he kind of had an all around game. He could pass it underneath. He kept throwing lobs to I believe his name was Johnson, um, the kind of the, the tall guy who yeah. was fouled out. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so he was yeah. so yeah. Those are kind of some of my early thoughts on that. Well, you know the uh, the players that you mentioned. So you you, you asked about or you you brought up about you don't know where they're projected to be drafted. I mean, yeah. I looked around various websites and the highest um, projected draft guy in that in that game last night was uh, Donovan Klingon, the center for UConn. Uh, seven foot two. He's got good size. He's pretty athletic. You know, he doesn't. You know, he can shoot the three, but it's not really a skill set of his right now. But you know, he's a really good defender. I, that's one thing that stuck out about him is that he can play some good D. 
Um, is he athletic enough for the NBA? I mean, he can. I mean, you got guys like Jakob Pertl who plays, you know, for the Toronto Raptors. Uh, he doesn't really, you know, he's not very athletic, you know, but he actually does the job. He's a big guy and he, he does the right, he can board, he can D. Yeah. So I kind of see him being in that mold, but he's projected to be, a lottery pick, uh, Donovan. Really? Like, he's probably like a top 10 pick. Uh, I've seen him as high as six and as low as 10 wow. uh, on, on various draft boards. And then wow. the next guy that appears on there um, on the draft high is uh, Stefan Castle. Uh, because, you know, he's a six foot six guy. You can see that he's a really good defender. I mean, you can yep. see that. He's a yep. very, very good defender. You know, he kind of, you know, he kind of reminds me, you know, of a, a younger you know, Andrew Wiggins, who's defensive minded, right? Because uh, he's very, you know, sleek, you know, he's, he's, he's very, you know, strong He's a bigger kid. Uh, and so I can see why he's being projected because, you know, if you look at the NBA recently in the last maybe 10 to 15 years, there's been a big emphasis on drafting defensive minded guys, uh, defensive minded guys that can evolve to be you know, offensive players and become a two-way player, right? You know, um, you know, I would say back in, you know, the 80s and 90s when we were watching the game, you know, it, I wouldn't say defense really stood out as much. It was really definitely a, a big offensive uh, game, you know, but then the big guys are the ones who asserted themselves. I mean, we saw a flashback last, last night of, you know, the big guys kind of dominating the game, right? Which, you know, it, it's kind of becoming the trend a little bit again in the NBA, um, you know, as, as the Warriors have kind of started to get slower and, and older, right? They, they brought this brand of basketball that you see today in the NBA, you know, where the outside shooting and a lot of cutting and, and just a lot of spacing. But we saw a throwback right here, right? So I can, yeah. I can see why Stefan Castle is, you know, looked at very favorably by NBA scouts because of his size and just his sheer determination of being, you know, a, a good defensive player. And you can see that he was doing that very well last night. Can't shoot yeah, very he was, well. He guard the point guard who's yeah. listed at six foot, but uh, that, that kid ain't six foot. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're talking about uh, the, uh, the, the, the Purdue the point, point guard. guard you're talking about Purdue. Bra yeah, Braden Smith. Braden Smith. Smith. Yes, so, yeah. That, that, that kid yeah. is not six foot. And, you know, they had him on. You know, no, and you bring up a good point. I mean, you know, you I think of guys like Kawhi Leonard, who was drafted for his defense, right? He was right. offense second. Latrell Sprewell was drafted for his defense. Back you know, he became an offensive yep. player. I, I agree. If you're a shutdown defender, it's a lot easier to teach offense than the other way around. It seems like offensive guys. Absolutely. I can't think of many offensive guys who picked up their defense. You know, later on, yeah, uh, Jimmy or, Butler is another one. Jimmy Butler yeah, is Jimmy another Butler, one. Yeah, Shea, Shea Gilgis Alexander is another yes. one. Yes, you know, he's a defensive-minded guy. He came out of Kentucky, and uh, you know, he's 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 now evolved his offensive game. He wasn't like that when he first came to the league. He's been right. in the league for six years, but a lot of people didn't know about him because he just yeah. really, you know, the small market, right? But the, you know, the the, the 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 NBA scouts are looking for big guys, you know, that are versatile, that are that that can. That can inter that can uh, uh, create a positionless style of basketball where you have all these guys that can guard every position and guys that are athletic and long and play defense are who these NBA scouts are definitely salivating. So that I can see why Stephon Castle is up yeah. there. The next guy that I saw um, that's on the draft boards after that is uh, the guy you already brought up, Tristan Newton. Tristan okay. Newton. You know, he's he's kind of a combo guard. I wouldn't say he's a point guard. He's a kind of a combo guard, which isn't a bad thing in today's NBA. It no. used to be a bad thing yes. back in the day. Like, yeah. we don't know where to put this guy, right? It's a tweener. And that used to be a bad, you know, bad thing for players, right? They wanted people who were just either a point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center, and that's it, you know? But now there's value in having guys who can do both. So Tristan, Tristan Newton, I think, is a guy – that is attractive because of his size. He's a six foot five guy. He can he can play point guard. He can play shoot, shooting guard. You know he can be kind of like another Anthony Edwards like kind of player, right? You know kind of the same build. You know he's a big muscular kid, um, and and he's pretty athletic. So you know that that's the next guy. And then the very last guy is Zach Eady. And I think the reason why you know they haven't projected in the late first round, you know, probably like around the 28th through 30th pick. And, you know, I've seen it sometimes being a little higher, but I think, you know, the eye test shows that this guy, you know, he's, he's, he's a good college basketball player because he's so freaking big, right? He's seven foot four, 300 pounds. You know, you get him the ball. There's not many people in the college that are like that. So he's going to stand out. Right. But he's, yeah. he reminds me of Yao Ming kind of Yao Ming, but with not as, not as skilled as Yao Ming. That's what he reminds me of. 
Yeah, well, it's interesting that you say Klingon is uh, is uh, projected to be higher. That's That's got to be purely for his shooting. I mean, because down in the blocks, Edie's much better in the blocks. But that doesn't for sure. That seems for to sure. count less nowadays. I think I think it's more because he's a, a, a defensive minded big guy, I and mean, he was playing yeah. Edie pretty damn well, man. Honestly, well, he was. I was he impressed was. in how well he was making Edie work. And you know, you could see some of the counter moves that Edie started doing because of how you know Klingon was defending him. You could see that you know Edie is definitely skilled with. The offensive side. I mean, he, he did some turnaround hook shots. I was like, whoa, this guy's, you know, he has some pretty good skills there, right? The only yeah. thing that concerns me about him in the NBA is that guy, there's going to be very athletic guys and he's going to, you know, he's he's going to be forced to have to, to be able to guard guys on the outside. And that's a liability, you know, I, for a guy I, that, I that, that's not able to move like him, right? I, I mean, Jokic, as good as he is, he's a liability on the defensive end because he can't move as well, right? He's not as, as athletic. You know, right. whereas a go bear, go bear can move. He can go anywhere. He can guard anywhere in any position. He's, he's a seven foot guy, but he's very athletic and he's very long. Right. So, yeah. you know, that's what the NBA guys, if, 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 if clean could be like a Rudy go bear, he's a value. And that's probably why they think he could become like him because you know, that he already has a de- the defensive instincts. He's not really offensive minded. Neither was, neither is Rudy Gobert. He's not an offensive minded guy. He gets his points and he gets, you know, by putbacks and, you know, and, 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 and lobs and stuff, but he's not like trying to create his own shot. And that's kind of what the mold of, of a Klingon, I think, honestly, I think Klingon would be perfect for the Warriors. Honestly, Klingon would be a good fit for the Warriors. Cause that's, he does a lot of the things that they need. Um, you know, he's a bigger version of Trace Jackson Davis. So. Yeah, I'm a little concerned about his footwork because Gobert has better footwork than Klingon does. Klingon's still a little slow, but I agree. I mean, especially down in the low blocks where Edie was like right underneath the hoop and Klingon managed to like block a couple, defend a couple, have a miss from really close range. So, so curious about the Warriors. Do you see him what is coming off the bench guy? Do you see him as what do you see him on, on the Warriors squad? Um. I, okay, I, I I would say that you know for next year, I think Trace Jackson Davis because of his versatility, I think yeah. he's going to be the starting big um, next year. If they were to draft get Klingon, which they wouldn't be able to do it unless they make a trade, right? Um, because Klingon's going to be drafted, you know, in the tenth. But let's just say fantasy land here that yep. they do get him, right? Yep. Yeah, he would definitely be coming off the bench, but they would have two guys that are very similar in skill set. So with Trace Jackson Davis, for instance, sits, Klingon can come in and fit right in, right? He does a lot of the same things that Trace Jackson Davis can do. Um, and he's probably a little bit more defensive-minded, uh, at least one-on-one defensively, than Trace Jackson Davis. Trace, Trace Jackson Davis, I think, is being tutored by by Draymond to be a very good help defender, and I think that's what he is right now. He's a very good help defender. Um, but I think Klingon, right now, from what I've seen, he's a better you know, post defender, kind of, you know, one-on-one defender. I, I, I don't, I'm sure he's good, you know, a help defender, but that's what I see. I, I, I think he'd be a great fit for what the Warriors. I, I, I agree with the post. I'm still dubious on, on kind of players outside, guarding players outside, guarding smaller players, guarding things of that nature. I'm still a little dubious because the one that, the one thing that did stand out to me, and it's hard to, it's hard to calculate, but when I was watching the game, everyone on both teams seemed to move so much lower than an NBA game. Like everyone was just so much slower paced, which then causes me concern for anybody that's playing defense, right? Their lateral defense doesn't have to be as quick. They don't need to move as fast. So I, I'm I'm curious where Klingon goes because I, if you were to ask me, just kind of looking at him, I'm thinking he's between 15 and 20 in the first round. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I outside think of the lottery, that's what you think. That's what you think. That's what you think. That's what that, yeah, that's that's your that's what you observe and based on what you know about basketball. But I, I can see why he's you know it's not a very deep draft for the, the other thing, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, you know, remember Mike Dunleavy, right? He was drafted number three, and he's probably yeah. not a number three talent, right? He probably was a later. Yeah. But the draft, you can't help it where he's being drafted. It's just because relatively he was better than most in that draft. Same thing here. It's not a very deep draft, and I think that's part of the reason why you see. Okay you know, uh, Klingon okay. kind of being up there. Uh, you know, if you kind of see, like, you know, the draft picks that are going, a lot of them are coming from the European League. A lot of them are coming from the G League Ignite, you yeah. know, the G League in general, right? So so that the first five or ten picks, that's, you know, where this guy, you know, that's where 
you know, um, those guys are falling, you know, yeah. that's why you get like, you know, I think the first guy that I see that's coming off the board that's in college is this guy from Kentucky, uh, Rob Dillingham. Um, yeah. he, he, he was, yeah, he's Kentucky. Hey, anyway, Rob Dillingham is the guy, the guy who's a point guard and he's, he's got like this explosiveness to him that, yeah. you know, he comes off the bench, but they think that he has a lot of, uh, uh NBA, uh, kind of Kyrie like skills, right? You know, uh, in which you know we're, we're kind of doing a little foreshadowing of what your talk is, is going to yeah. come about the skill yeah. level, right? Yeah, skill but level. Uh, but anyway, so I think we we pretty much uh, beat this one uh, to the yeah. end. Of, you know, it was a good game uh, for about the first ten minutes, and then yeah. after that, you know, yeah. it just you could see what was happening, and UConn yeah. just uh, did, did their game plan, and and they won seventy five to sixty over Purdue. So just, all right, so real quick, uh -huh. just real quick, a yeah. comment. Uh, did you see when Hurley pushed his player and he got a yeah on that? I thought that was funny. I thought that was that funny. That's, funny. That's, that's a little He's bit of fire. Little Bobby Knight I, I, I like, going on right there. I like that guy, man. I like yeah, his fire. Yeah. I just like the way he is. He's cool. I can yeah. see why the, the players like him. You know, they, he's yeah. a fiery guy. He's just kind of like one of them. He's not trying to be bigger than them. And he's just one of them, right? He's, yeah. And uh, I, I, I just like the guy, man. And yeah. a lot of people comment on just kind of like how you know, kind of a spicy personality is, but I think that's what makes, that's, that's his appeal. That's, that's well, I, I, I agree. Like I like it too. Cause he seems to, it seems to come from a good place, right? It doesn't seem to come right. from a place of anger or bitterness or, you know, coming down, right. but you know, right. people like that tend to be polarizing either. You like them or you don't, but I, right. I like, exactly. I like to see his, his energy and, you know, his, him wanting to win that bat. Cause I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what, as a coach, I'd be the same exact way, man. I mean, we, you and I used to coach the yes. teams together, man. Yes. Right. Yes. We were both, yes. we both are fiery Latino guys. Yes. Man. We yes. Talk. I've gone we out of right? my life. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So, you know, uh, Anthony and I used to coach back in the day uh, when we were in high school. We coached, you know, uh, grade school. Uh, we didn't get to high school. We just uh, did grade school. I think fourth through eighth is what we did. Yep. So we had a yep. good time doing that. So yeah. we know yeah, our hoops. My daughter's basketball but, a couple years as well. But there yeah. you go, man. Right. There you go. All right, man. So let's go to the next topic. So the next topic I wanted to talk about is, you know, the, the NBA regular season is, is coming to an end this week. Yes, it um, is. You know, the the, the East. You know the the, the east the, the the it's not as competitive in my opinion uh, as the west and it's pretty evident you know because if you look at the east uh, standings you know the number two through number six they're 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 only separated by two and a half uh, two and a half games uh, yep. you know if you look at the 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 two C because Boston is so dominant I mean. They were they were just putting. I was watching the Boston game tonight. By the way, uh, they were playing Milwaukee. And by the way, you know, just a quick little aside. You know, I don't know if you've seen lately, but the the refs seem to be kind of like swallowing the whistles lately. They don't yep. really call a lot of things, and yep. I don't know where that what happened and how that happened because it was kind of getting annoying when they were making all these calls. But we saw tonight in tonight's game. I don't know if you watched it, but there was only two free throw attempts by both teams combined tonight's game. Holy it crap. ended. It ended 30 minutes earlier than it was supposed to, right? So because you don't see, and the, the, the commentators are making that comment. It's like, man, it, we've never seen this, you know, right? I think it's only happened like one at a time, and I don't know how long, but anyway. But Boston has been very dominant. You know, they, they, they're they're a dominant team. They get bored, I think, sometimes is why they lost by, you know, when they were up by 30 points to Atlanta. You know, it's, it's human nature. Once you're ahead, you kind of yeah. just like, yeah, we got these guys, right? And then you kind of let your guard down and then, you know, crap happens, right? And that's yeah. why I think coaches tend to keep their players in, even with two minutes left, if they're up by like 15 or 20, right? Because they yeah. know what can happen. It can happen quickly. So, but if you look at the East, two through six is only separated by two and a half games. Yep. Then you look at the West. The West, you go from six through 10, and they're only separated by three games. So it's yep. very, very, it's going to be very interesting what happens here in the final week. I mean, right now, the the all the teams have been, you know, decided, you know, we know that, you know, one through 10 in each conference, they've already clinched. But what we don't know is essentially where they're all going to fall, except for Boston. Boston is the only one that we know that he, they're the number one seed in the East, Correct. but in the West, we don't know. Well, so Boston is the number one seed till they win the championship. If that's what they're going to do, because they'll win it in the, exactly. they'll, they'll, they'll be the number one seed in the finals too. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I mean but, 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 you know, it just shows like how competitive this league is right now. So what I wanted to ask you, Tuan, is looking at, let's, let's focus on the East first, right? Okay. Um, what, what matchups do you see 
that intrigue you? It could be playing. And by the way, you know, just to revisit the playing, yep. I think last last week when we were talking about it, Call I think we, we were under the assumption it was di- it was a different format, and it, and we just we just kind of were trying to remember, and we didn't remember it. But I, I researched it, and it's actually you know the seven and eight teams. Whoever wins, they move on automatically. You you win, and that's it. The loser of that seven and eight plays the winner of the nine ten, and then the, the whoever wins that game has to go ahead and yep. uh, they get the eighth seed, right? So, um, so the, you know, the Warriors being in the 10th position, they're going to have to win two road games essentially right now, unless unless crap happens in the next four games where they move up, right? But anyway, so what do you see as far as, uh, uh, you know, intriguing games in the East, whether it be playing or first round? And is, well, is there anybody that you see that can unseat Boston? Well, I, I said it last week. I think the Pacers are a team to be on the lookout for. I think they're they're a well balanced team. I like the way they play. Um, I like their approach. I think that I think that they have the possibility of of setting Boston. So if I were to look at that, I don't know how it's all going to fall out. Obviously, uh, presuming like kind of touching back on last week a little bit, like Philly plays Miami. Now that right. Embiid is back, yeah. Even though I don't, even though I bet I bet against Miami every year, and Miami seems to pull it off, I'm going to say Philly beats Miami. Then Miami beats either nine or ten. Right. So so basically one through eight is going to stay at one through eight. I can't okay. see Miami beating Boston, but Miami's got a lot of experience, but I don't see it happening from there. You know, we're looking at Philly, Milwaukee, Indiana, Orlando. Right. That would be what it is today. Like you said, there's like a couple of games separating all of this. So this is subject to change. But I can see right. I can see the Pacers beating uh, the Magic easily. So I can see that happening easily. Uh, New York, Cleveland. Again, I think that's one of the guys that you mentioned, one of the teams you mentioned last week as a team that you yep. think is a little bit of a powerhouse. I still would take Cleveland in that pickup. Um, but but I think, to me, if you're asking me to pick, I would say Indiana has the best possibility of beating Cleveland. I mean, of beating you know, the, uh, Boston. You know, uh, with respect to the Knicks and Cavaliers, so when I when I brought this up last time, I, I, you know, I still think they're a dangerous team. But yep. when I was making that comment, I yep. was thinking Julius Randle was going to come back, oh, and okay. he's not. He's, he's, he's not, out. He's so done. he's not coming back. Yeah. So, you know, they, they brought, they got back uh, Mitchell Robinson. They also got back OG on an Anobi. So, so they, the only guy they're missing is, is, is Julius Randle. But I think that they have been able to, you know, uh, uh, adjust without, you know, Julius Randle, because it's been so long since he's played. So they figured out how to work without him and they still continue winning. So uh, I still think they're a dark horse. You're saying Cleveland. I, well, I think New yeah. York. I think well between those two, I think Cleveland would beat New York. But to me, my, my dark horse, I'm going to stick with the Pacers. I think the Pacers are going to make some noise in the postseason. Okay. And, yeah. and what about the Bucks? What do you what do you think of the Bucks? Oh, by the way, before I even oh, get there, oh. Bucks. Did you did you know Giannis uh, sustained a calf injury, which they fear could be uh, more than that. They're, he's going to have an MRI tomorrow because he had a non contact uh, uh, injury uh, happen. Yeah. He started kind of jogging up the court and kind of fell to the ground. So, and he was kind of, you know, doing the same thing that Kevin Durant was doing uh, when that happened to him with his Achilles. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and he wasn't walking very well after. So anyway, but what do you, what do you think about Milwaukee now that you know that information? No, I mean, wh- whether that information or not, I mean, obviously this information makes it worse for Milwaukee. I, I think Milwaukee's just falling apart. I just think that th- they're, they're at risk of losing in the very first round. I just think that they're, when they traded away, when they traded away Drew Holiday, I think that was a mistake. I think they should have never done it. Um, I agree. I agree. Um, I agree. Uh, you know, I know they picked up Dame Lillard, but I just that's not a that wasn't a good trade off for them. They needed Drew Holiday was their leader, kind of was their was the heart of that team, and I just think that they're not going to do. Well. I don't. Milwaukee's kind of rough for me because I don't know what they're going to do from here going forward. But my prediction is Milwaukee loses in the second round at the latest. They'll lose maybe well, maybe I, in the first round. Maybe in the first. Maybe without in the Giannis, first, they're a in the different second team, man. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, yeah, we'll I'm, I'm not, I hope I'm he not doesn't angry. get injured. Yeah, and the whole Doc Rivers thing, you know, Doc has a reputation of teams kind of falling apart under his realm, especially teams that are favorites, you know, as he's had with many of the Boston teams and things of that nature. So to me, I don't think that was necessarily a smart move picking up Doc Rivers, uh, but – they they need they need something they need something yeah uh, no I hear you I hear you they don't have it yeah, but that, right 
that pretty much seals their fate if, if Giannis can't play, man. Um, they're, they're oh, gonna, absolutely. If Giannis can't play, it's for sure. It's for sure. They're, over. They're, they're, yeah. they're dropping yeah. to, like, you know, a six through eight seed at that point. But I'm saying even with Giannis, you know, I, I can see them not not going much further than the second round. In the okay. Places. So, yeah. so you, 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 uh, you essentially called that, you know, the Miami Heat and the Sixers are going to rep- uh, be the representatives from the play-in. To Correct. Get the seven and eight seeds, and then you also have Indiana being the potential dark horse to upset Boston Correct. if they get to that point, right? Yep. Yeah. All right. How about you? So let's go to let's go to the, let's go to the, uh, so let me get, I'll give you my take real quick. Yeah, I, I agree with you that I think Sixers and Heat advance. To me, I think the dark horse is Miami Heat, man. Miami Heat and the New York Knicks are the two dark horses in the in the East right. that I think could give the Celtics. Some trouble. We already saw that Miami beat the Celtics last year, right? Yep. Now yep. the Celtics are going to be more motivated to do it this year because they they got embarrassed, right? They 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 thought, oh, what the hell? We got a playing team coming here and trying to beat us. Yeah, right. And look what happened: a playing team beat them. Uh, and that's part of the reason why you see you know a lot of these guys in the nine ten position on both sides having some hope because last year you had two playing uh, guys go at least to the conference finals and one of them got to the finals. Right. Yep. So, yep. so that that's a good example for, you know, for, for coaches to lean on and say, Hey, look, you you can do it. So, so don't give up. Right. So play hard. Right. So I, I, I say Miami or Knicks can create okay. enough problems that they could potentially okay. upset Celtics, but the Celtics, I think are just different this year, man. I think they're going to be tough to beat. I don't well, think one, one thing just that you touched upon earlier was that 30 point lead that they lost. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Um, and the reason I'm concerned about that type of attitude, if they lost interest is if you're a championship team and you've won championships, you know what it takes and you can flip it. On. I mean, we can argue whether you should be doing that or not, but for the sake of argument, they, they can't do that not having won a championship with this current regime. I, I just don't I don't think that they can afford to to kind of just lay off the gas. I think that they should be hungry, especially the way that they've gone out of the playoffs the last two or three seasons. I, I, yep. I think that they should be pushing it to the max every bit of the game. Once they win a championship or two and they know what it takes, then maybe we can have a little bit of a different conversation. So that that attitude concerns me going into the playoffs because – Teams like Miami, they're not – they don't lay off, right? They, they'll put, yeah. they'll put your, their foot to your throat and they'll they'll choke you out, you know, as yep. quickly as they can. And if if Boston thinks they're good enough because their record or because, you know, the competition or whatever, I'd be a little weary of that. And I think that – I think that there is a, a strong possibility that some team will, will knock them out here and, not, and then not make it to the, to the finals. Okay, so you're saying the probability is higher than everybody thinks. Well, I just think that they're if 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 they blew a thirty point lead because they lost interest, I think that's a bad sign. You know, if it's just one of those nights where hey, yeah. things just turned on you, you know, things like that. But it happens though. It happens it, every it, team. It, no, it, no, especially now. I mean, twenty point leads yeah. are what they used to be, right? With the, if right. somebody goes on a run with three point barrage, then you're back in the game. But right. I'm just saying, if they, if they lost interest, you mentioned that you know earlier that they maybe lost interest or you know they. You know, it's they're, human they're, they're nature. Once you're up by a lot, man, you kind of just kind of relax. Yeah. You know, it yeah. happens to yeah. everybody, right? No, so, it does. But uh, you know, you're hoping that that happens to someone who's already won championships and they know what it takes. These guys haven't yeah, gotten the, they haven't gotten to that plateau yet. So yeah, here because you, you, you're, you're, you're referring to the Warriors. There, you're referring to the Warriors because the Warriors were notorious for doing that, turning it off Correct. and on, right? Correct. And they well, had, I mean, they the Bulls used to do it. The Lakers used to do it. You know, the Pistons used to do it. They all. Because they knew what it took. They knew when to turn it on. And, yeah. and Boston doesn't yeah. know that yet because they haven't played. Yeah, that's fair. It. It's a, it's a fair argument. It's a fair, yeah. fair point. So, all okay. right. So, let's move on to the West. Um, so, we, uh, we 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 can go ahead and try and finish this within an hour. So, um, <laughs> all right. So, what about the in the West? What are the intriguing matchups that you see um, both playing and, and uh, in, 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 the, in the playoffs? Well, last week when we spoke, I mentioned, you know, the Timberwolves. I thought that they were – so, interestingly enough, they're – Tied for first place with Denver. Uh, right. I, You know, obviously, it's hard for me to say I consider the number one seed a dark horse. But Minnesota hasn't done much. You know, Denver's the the champion. So that's someone right. they got to get past. So to me, that one-two matchup, that Denver-Minnesota matchup is intriguing to me. Like, like I think that no matter how the seeds end, if those yeah. two play for the uh, Western Conference Finals, 
Minnesota is going to be the underdog, right? They just, they just will. But I I think that they have the potential to go all the way. I think that they're, they're a solid squad. Um, I think they're, like I mentioned last week, they're built on defense. Um, I think that that's important. Um, I, I think that they're very exciting. And as I mentioned last week, um, the Thunder's still really young. You know, I just think that, you know, they may, they may shock a person here or, or not. And then, of course, the, the ever-present Clippers. The Clippers got a lot. They got Harden. They got Paul George. They got Kawhi. They got a lot of older heads, as we would say back in the day. Uh, they got a lot of older heads that, you know, if they turn it on, if they stay healthy. But my question with Kawhi is always his desire, right? Um, you know, he gets hurt quite a lot. I don't want to question, you know, his injuries or what pain he's going through. But, you know, if he can stay healthy throughout the playoffs, he's a difference maker. He can win. He's proven it. He can win a series by himself. So yep. the Clippers are obviously um, someone there. And then the Mavericks at this point, I'm going to, I'm going to say no, like the Mavericks. I don't know. Oh. Yeah. I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, what is the, the show me state? Is it Missouri? I'm going to go the show me state, right? So I got a show me state <laughs> for the West, which is the Dallas Mavericks. And I got a show me state in the East, which is the New York Knicks. Right. So to okay. me, those, those are two teams. Like you better show me something before I start believing in you. And oh man! So to me, the Mavericks, I think, are the darkest horse in the West. To me, okay. uh, now you know with those two moves that they made, where they brought in PJ Washington and Daniel Gafford. Yep. Man, now they have athleticism at the big level, right? And these yep. guys, uh, you know, uh, especially PJ Washington, he can shoot. You know, so he's one of these stretch fives, uh, stretch four or five kind of kind of guys, and he plays good deep. I, I think that that move was genius, honestly. Um, you know, th- then they have these other guys that can shoot from the outside, you know, a Tim Hardaway, you know, who can shoot, uh, you know, and then of course, Kyrie Irving can break every defense down as well as Luka Doncic doing the same thing. They have two guys there that just break defenses down and just pass to the open guy whenever they want. So to me, they're going to be an issue. The only thing that I would say against them mm-hmm. is both those guys are not very good defenders. Yes. Kyrie and Luka are not good defenders and they can be had. But well, they're not they willing have, defenders, which is a difference, right? They're not exactly, but they have other guys on that team that can kind of, you know, fill in the void for you, or kind of, you know, like a Draymond Green, a great help defenders, right? They they have guys on that team that could essentially, you know, make up for any mistakes, not all mistakes, but some mistakes. If if they do it too much on the defensive end, then yeah, they're going to be a liability. But they're already a liability as it is. If you look at comparatively against other teams that have good wings and, and good and good uh, guards uh, that are both offensive, defensive minded, these guys are the cream of the crop on the offensive side. There, there is no oh, disputing that on I the agree. guard side. They are they are the cream of the crop. There is no way that nobody can stop both of these guys at once. There's no team who can do it. Even as versatile as the Boston Celtics are, I don't think they can do it. So. To me, the Mavericks are the dark horse. All right, so let, go, keep going. You were talking about you know, yeah. So just just one stuff. thing about the the offensive side of the Dallas skill set. I'll be curious to see how they respond when the refs are swallowing their whistles, you know, and and they're having a rough <laughs> yeah. time getting to the. Well, hole. yeah, we know we know about Luca. He's a he just cries and whines all the time. Correct, yeah, you're right. correct. But right. it's not only that; it, it it impacts the 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 strength of their game, right? So now what are they when you take away the strength? Because they're going to get bodied. They're going to get pushed around. You know, the whistles are not going to blow as as frequently so all right so going down the line here phoenix man i don't know what to think about phoenix right at times i look at duran and i'm like ah he's he's done right like he's getting older it's not and then i look at duran and he looks strong you know uh booker hasn't won anything of significance without you know somebody by his side uh beal is um you know he's in and out of the lineup i mean i think they're starting to pro. He's injury prone this year. Yeah, yeah, correct. And I mean, you know, so has Durant been the last couple of years. He's been injury prone. I think if they can stay healthy, maybe they win a first round. Maybe they upset, you know, someone in the higher bracket who they'd be facing, what, the Thunder right now? I could see them beating the Thunder. I can see that happening. But I think after that, I think that, no, I think they're going to be done. And then the Pelicans. The Pelicans have the the potential to be, like, if we're going to go true dark horse, I can see the Pelicans being somewhat of a dark horse. They've got a, a pretty solid squad. They're pretty evenly balanced. You know, uh, Zion seems to be waking up and playing a little bit better as of late. So that's, that's a pretty good function there. Sacramento's dying. I mean, they're just, they're fading. <laughs> they're fading fast. As a matter of fact, I'm sitting here going, Hey, I hope Sacramento 
I hope the Lakers get above Sacramento because I think if the Warriors play Sacramento, I think they're going to beat them, right? I think. I agree. They, and, and I have a lot of questions around the Lakers, right? Um, so we'll see. But outside of that, I don't think the Lakers or the Warriors are going to make much noise in this playoff. So in terms of kind of reassessing from last week, um, in the in the Pelicans Kings, I think the Pelicans beat the Kings, and I yep. think whoever wins from the Lakers and the Warriors, which right now I'm probably going to. I hate them saying this, but I'm probably going to say the Lakers beat the Warriors and then the Lakers beat the Kings. And it'll be the Lakers will be the eighth seed and the, the Pelicans will be the seventh seed. That's kind of the way I'm but looking at it. You know what, though? Check this out, though. Check this yeah. out, though, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Sacramento Kings lost tonight, right? Yep. So they're they're now the numbers nine seed right now. Okay. So um, it just flopped. So it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just flopped. I mean, they're tied right now for the ninth seed. And, you know, we'll see what's going to happen tonight. But we know that Anthony Davis isn't playing tonight, um, you know, against the Warriors. And Anthony Davis is a matchup problem for the Warriors, no matter how you look at it. So the Warriors, I think they're going to be, they're going to have their game faces on. They're going to want to win this game because they're going to want to climb the ladder themselves, right? But right now, the Kings and, and Lakers are tied. So if the, if the Lakers lose, then, you know, the, the they stay where they're at, right, as far as the Lakers do. Um, but if the Warriors win... You know, there we go. Then you got the uh, Warriors are now uh, ten, and then you got the the Kings at eight. So, um, but anyway, Correct. so so you're saying the Lakers will come out as well as the Pelicans, and then from there, yeah. do you see anybody? Uh, out, uh, you know, let's say, do you see? I mean, to me, the, to me, the team, the, the, the teams that beat, from my perspective, are the Celtics in the East and in the West. I think the Nuggets because of the defending champs, right? Yeah. So, yeah. who do you? But you're saying the Minnesota Minnesota Timberwolves. Yeah are going to be the guys that you think could beat the Denver Nuggets, right? I, I actually than, will tell you, they're my choice for the, the going to the finals. I think the Timberwolves oh, are wow. going to go to the finals. Yeah. Wow. That's how strongly wow. I feel about them. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, I, man. I, I don't know. I, I don't I know, man. I think they are. Woo! Yeah, we'll know, see. Bro. I mean, you know, obviously we'll be meeting every week. So if I've got mud on my face here in a couple of weeks, we'll, <laughs> we'll know it. But um, I think the Timberwolves are a solid, solid squad. Uh, I think Anthony Edwards is – he's built with the right stuff. I think he's – he. I think that, I think that they're going to they're gonna represent the West. All right. Yeah. All right. So, and I think, right, unfortunately, well, I think my Warriors aren't going to make the, the playoffs. They'll make the play I, I think the, I think the, the Warriors are going to uh, – let's put it this way. I, I, I know that nobody wants to play the Warriors. I know I that agree. for a fact, right? They're a smaller team, but believe it or not, they're the best rebounding team in the, in, in the NBA right now. So that's interesting, counterintuitive, because they're not that big, right? But they just have a lot of greedy guys on that team. And a lot of these young guys, I, I think, have picked them all up, you know? So, you know, unfortunately, Steve Kerr realized that too late. I think he should have played, played them a long time ago at this level that they're doing right now. But, you know, it's better late than never. And, and, and they're at this point right now. They're fighting. You know, they're, they're in the play-in, but they're trying to get higher than that. And, and they could. I think that that's their motivation. So I think that they're going to make some noise, in my opinion, Okay. I don't know if they'll go to the finals, but I think they're going to be a, a challenge for some players, right, well, especially I'm, if they hey, come out of the first You know me. I hope you're right. You're always the optimist. I'm, I tend to be the pessimist. I hear you. The only thing, the only thing that would have changed my mind, and obviously we won't see it today, I'd really like to see Trace Jackson Davis take a nice solid run in Anthony Davis and see how he plays. Can he? Yeah. I mean, obviously, he's not going to stop Anthony Davis, but can he put him in some foul trouble? Contain can him. He, contain him. You know, yeah. yeah, contain him. Can he, you know, can he? you know, take some rebounds away from him or, or things of that nature. If, if I were right. to see that tonight and but well, obviously we're not, then I think that that might put some, a little more hope with me. But right now the, the Lakers are just, they're big, they're a big squad and it's just hard for the Warriors to deal with big squads. The Warriors have had I agree. issues I with agree. long, tall squads all season long. Yep. I agree. Yep. So, all right. So we cover the, the, uh, the, the, the playoff uh, and playing outlook. All I right. think we put enough time to that thing. So now we're going to go on to your topics and the, yes. the final two segments. So go ahead all and right. take it away, man. All right. So the first one I want to talk about is it's, it's a, like I said, it's a, it's an article from a website called fadeaway world. Um, the list is the most, or the article is the most skilled NBA players of all time. So I wanted to go through with this a little bit because you and I have had a lot of conversations, uh, you know, um, one of the conversations that I remember, uh, and I don't think we were necessarily on opposite ends, but was, was discussing Shaquille O'Neal's greatness. And my thing is, like, it's it's like me going into a room playing with a bunch of kindergartners. Like, who's going to stop me? I mean, you couldn't stop that dude. And so, you know, the fact that he didn't shoot free throws that well, the fact that he really couldn't shoot from outside of 10, 12 feet very well. I mean, to me, I you know, he's dominant. I don't, I will never dispute that with anyone. But how much skill did he really have? 
he was just big and he was blessed to be big and very, very athletic. Now, athletic, we can argue that's a skill, but he could just move like he was 6'2", except he was, you know, seven foot plus and 340 pounds, 50 pounds. No one was going to stop him. So anyway, that's why this article intrigued me because of conversations that we had like that in the past. So I'm going to kind of, I'm going to go over all the names here and then we'll kind of, we'll, we'll kind of break it down a little bit. So at the top of the pyramid is Jordan and Kobe, right? They're, they're the top, they're considered the most skilled players. Then the layer below that is going to be Allen Iverson, Kyrie, Steph, and uh, Durant, right? That's the layer below them, right? Uh, So, and then at the third level, so there's five levels total. At the third level, we got Akeem, we got Larry Bird, we got Isaiah Thomas, we got Jerry West, James Harden, and Chris Paul. That's at the third tier. Um, At the fourth tier, which I think is fascinating because I can just see all of the LeBron lovers just having this, like freaking out at this thing, is LeBron. At the fourth is LeBron. Uh, Nash, Luca, which might be a little early in his career to start having putting him in these type of things, but Luca, Magic, uh, Oscar Robertson, Tracy McGrady, and Pete Maravich, right? That's the fourth level. And then the final level here, we've got uh, Kawhi, Carmelo, Dwayne Wade, uh, Kevin Garnett, Jokic, um, oh man, Nowitzki, uh, Stockton. Uh, is that, is that Iceman? That's Iceman, baby. That is Iceman, right? That's, uh, Gervin. Uh, we got Tim, got, yep, got Tim Duncan. We got Paul George and we got Damian Lillard, right? So that's, that's the way the pyramid is built. So a couple things, you know, obviously being a Warrior fan, I'm like, crap, how is Steph in the second tier? Like Steph's the most dominant shooter, but I kind of digested this. I looked at it. And so my my so well let me pause there. Well, let, let, actually, let me ask you a question to kind of help frame this a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this: What do you think are the skills that basketball players should have to be on that top layer? Let me ask you that: What are the sure. skills that you think that they should have? So I, I think that the most skilled players should be able to reflect to some degree equally both on offense and defense. I think that that is the most critical part, which is why I don't have a problem with Jordan and Kobe being at the top of this pyramid because they were both outstanding offensive and defensive players. Jordan was probably, Jordan is probably the ideal in that sense, right? He was, you know, one top, and this has always been my argument when you get into the LeBron Jordan discussions is, you know, Jordan won defensive player of the year. Like, I don't even know if LeBron's ever made an all defensive team. You know, we I can, think he we had it early. In his, I think early in his career he did. I don't you know. I don't. I, I don't have the information in front of me, but I know he, in, early in his career he was definitely more uh, defensive minded. Correct. So, so to me, you look at that, and Jordan's. I mean, that's that's huge to win Defensive Player of the Year, to win MVP of the Year, to win MVP of the Finals. I. I mean, the guy had very few flaws, and even early in his career, I'd be like, he can't shoot. Well, that was settled by you know year five or six. He had a. Very decent jumper, was very good. And Kobe, you know, obviously mimicked a lot of his game, a Absolutely. lot of his style, a lot of his things yep. off of Jordan. And he was very, very talented player. So I don't have any issues with that. So that's, to me, when I look at the skills, I got to look at both offense and defense. That's how you calculate it. And that's where you get to, to, to the next layer. But let me let me stop there and see your thoughts. Okay, so so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and agree with you. I don't have no problem with, Jordan and Kobe being at the very top because of how good they were on both sides of the ball, offensively and defensively. But if we want to break down like the skills, okay, to me, shooting is definitely a skill, right? You have to have it in basketball to be, you know, relevant in my opinion. Second one I think is passing ability. I think is a skill uh, for sure. Right. Um, And then rebounding is also a skill. um, And, and then another one, I would say, of course, playing defense is a skill, but it's a mindset that you have to have in order to play defense. And I think that's that's hard work, you know. And I was I would argue that hard work is a skill because not everybody can do it, right? They don't have the desire to do it. The desire to be good is is a skill, in my opinion. So I, I would say those four uh, particular in particular stand out to me. Uh, uh, athleticism, you know, I don't know if it's a skill; it, it's a gift. Is it a skill? I don't know. Can you get if you to me something is is a skill is if 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 you can build to be to be good at that, right? To me, Correct. right? 
So you can you can do shooting. You can learn to be a good shooter. You can learn to be a good passer. You can learn to be a good uh, rebounder, right? Um, you know, but the intangibles, like the basketball IQ, is that is that a a skill? You know, uh, can you teach that? Uh, I think you can to a certain point, but you you have it or you don't, man, right? So yeah. I, I, that that's kind of the the gray area for me, right? The basketball IQ, the desire to want to win, right? I mean, that's that is a skill because you know that both Kobe and and, and Jordan. They were that way, man. They yep. they did not want to lose. They would carry their teams and put their teams on their back no matter what. That's and I respect that they have those guys at the very top because they deserve to be at the top, right? I, I, so, I agree. I agree. Yep. Well, one thing I wanted to add to that is there's two to me two statistics on the defensive side that would define your defensive ability. If you're a guard or what we would call a smaller player, your ability to steal the ball or tip aways or Things of that yeah, nature. Deflections, right? deflections, yeah. right? And if you you're a big man, your ability to block shots. Anticipation, right? Yeah. So, correct. And then if you're a big man, your ability to block shots. You know, how many blocks do you get, right? Those type of things. So I would say that those two now, if you're a if you're a guy that can do both, then amen. Not too many of those guys have been around that can steal the ball and block the block the shots. But but yeah. So then we get to the next tier, which is Allen Iverson, you know, all offense, no defense. Kyrie, all offense, no defense. Uh, Steph, all offense, no defense. Durant, Durant is he can play. He's deep. all offense and he can play defense. Um, but he learned that he when he was a warrior. He learned that when he was a warrior, man. Honestly, Correct. he wasn't that good of a defender when he was in Oklahoma City. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And so, but if you look at them, right? You look at Allen Iverson change the game as a small man, right? I mean, for yeah. those older heads, you know, probably think back to Tiny Nate Archibald, who was kind of in a similar vein in the, in terms of his style that he played like Iverson. But Iverson changed the game in terms of his ability to get to the hoop, his toughness as a little guy, right? You look at Kyrie, like, that guy's got handles that are unbelievable. Like, like Absolutely. You, you will never you see wanna, that again, man. I mean, correct. he's incredible. He, correct. He's incredible. And then you go to, incredible. And then you go to Steph, like, best shooter in the history of of of, of, of the game. And that, that was the one thing that Steph, I guess, makes me most proudest as a Warrior fan is, like, you can argue – who the best dunker was. And you can argue who the best rebounder was. It is very few arguments about who the best shooter is. The best shooter is Steph. Like, like yep. no one's going to really argue with you, whether you're a Warriors fan or not. No one's really going to argue with you that there's, I mean, you got Reggie Miller, you got Clay Thompson, you got, you know, uh, Ray, Allen. Ray, Ray Allen. Allen, but Steph's better. And then you got Durant, Absolutely. who is the original unicorn, right? The guy who um, seven footer could play outside, could drive. So each of those guys bring a unique offensive skill set to the second level. So I think that's why they're in that second level because they're they're the leaders at their offensive skill, but co collectively they're very poor defense. Your thoughts on that second level? You know, I, I, I know why that those guys are in the second level is because they're predominantly known for one side of the ball, predominantly. Although you can make an argument that Kevin Durant, you know, is more defensive minded than the other three, which I, you know, I agree that, that he is. Um, it, 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 but they all are highly skilled offensive players in the second tier. And that's yep. pretty much why I think they're there, but they're all elite, right? They're all elite at what they do. Um, so that, that, that's, that's my thought. I think, I, th I think the, the, the writer had this, what we were talking about, the, the, the ability to be very skilled on both sides of the ball. And that's why Kobe and Jordan at the top, but the other ones, they're flawed in, in, in other areas. Correct. Correct. Right. So then we get to the third tier which this breaks my heart because Olajuwon, I think, should be higher. I absolutely. Think, I think I, absolutely. He should, should be in the, at least higher. the second tier, man. He should be at, at least, least in the this, second I, tier. I, I, I agree. But, you know, obviously maybe they did it this way so the pyramid would fit and it would work as a pyramid, right? But I agree. Olajuwon was a very, very, very good defender. Skilled. He had very feet, skilled. Good block shots and – Deals. Offensively, he was very good. I wouldn't say he was elite offensively, but off he was every bit the defensive guy that Allen Iverson was the offensive guy. Right. Yep. So 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 clearly when I look at Olajuwon, I can tell that this pyramid favors offense over defense. Right. Yep. So because they put the, the unique offensive guys higher. But to me, Olajuwon should be in that second tier at the lowest. At the lowest. Well, you know, yeah, real quick, 
if we're talking yeah. about elite offensive players, real quick, before there's one guy that they omitted that Kareem. Kareem should be oh. on this list. Oh he no, I that was the second yeah. tier. He should be on the second tier because he had the most unstoppable shot in the NBA that we've ever seen. So anyway, go ahead. I could Let's argue see. he could, might be on the first tier. I mean, he could block shots. He he was he won defense. I mean, he's 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 solid, solid defensive player. And and yes. I could I could make arguments for him to be on that first year, but absolutely not having Kareem here is a crime. I agree. Yep. So then we work right. our way through. We got Larry Bird and Isaiah Thomas and Jerry West. To me, I don't know if Harden belongs in this third tier. He probably. I I, I understand why he's there, but I, I he's he he should be lower. Honestly, I, I I agree with you. He shouldn't be in that tier. Although he's a really, really off, he's an offensively gifted athlete. I mean, he's he's the one who created the step back three point sh- uh, shot. We've never seen it before until he created it. He's the one who did Correct. it. Correct. And you know, he he's a bigger, stronger guard. He can break people down with his dribbling. He's a really good uh, d- uh, a dribbler. But you know, offensive that's all he is. He, he really he's a good passer too. We learned that when he became a you know, point guard at Houston. You know, because before that he wasn't really that. He was kind of more of a sixth man guy coming off for OKC. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I can see why he's there because he is very elite from an offensive standpoint. But I, I don't have a problem with him being lower. So Yeah, I, 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 I'd want him lower simply for the fact that he, he – not only does he not play defense, he blatantly doesn't care about defense. And to <laughs> me, like, that's got to count for something in terms of, like, negative skill points, right? Like – like for all the skill you have on the offensive side of the court, like you got to at least want to play defense, like at least be there. Right. So to me, I'd have him lower. Chris Paul is fascinating to me because out of everyone there, I think he is the most truest third level talent because he is very good offensive. He is good defensively, but just not as good as the players above. So to me, I look at that yeah. list and I look at, I look at, I look at Chris Paul and I'm going, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Like bird and Isaiah, Isaiah probably belongs there too. Bird, I'm a, I'm a little conflicted with on Bird. Yeah, I hear you, but you know he's he's a you know when we look back at his career, he's way better than we thought when he was yes. playing. Honestly, um, no, I agree. You know, you know the you know the commentary about you know and I forgot who said it. One one of the guys said, "Oh, you know if if he was black, he'd be average, right?" You know, and yep. he's, we're making all this noise because he's white, you know, and, and yep, yep. you know, there was a little bit of, you know, me believing that at that time. But yeah. as I look back and see this guy play, no. crap, he was hella good, man. He was he really more. freaking good. Way but I mean, if you put him in today's NBA, he would flourish cuz yep. he could shoot, right? Yep. And he's gritty. He could he could rebound, he could pass. You know, uh, defensive, he, he was smart. He was kind of like Mullen, right? He, he knew how to use his hands to, you know, uh, create steals, right? That wasn't yeah. really what he was known for, but he could do it. So I I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I understand why he's there is because I, I think a lot of people, like me, probably underestimated him when we, when yeah. we were watching him. I almost would want to put back. him, like, at a 2.5. Not quite at 3, mm-hmm. not quite at 2, yeah. kind of right. Right in between? In between yeah. those two. All yeah, right, yeah, now, yeah. now so, we're moving to level four. Now comes right. the, the topic at hand. The first guy yes. there, LeBron. What are your thoughts he on should, LeBron? He should, be, he, should, he should be higher, without a doubt. He should be way higher than that. I have a problem okay. with that. And I think the reason why he put him there is because of his sheer size. It's the same same argument you have with Shaq, right? But Shaq, he was just a big guy who could just use his size to score. This guy can do the same thing, but he's skilled as hell, man. He could shoot, he could pass, he can rebound. You know, he can play D when he wants to, when he wants to. Well, well let, let me let saying. me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Was is he as good or a better shooter than Larry Bird? No, Larry Bird's a better shooter. Okay. Is he as good or better of a low post threat than Akeem Olajuwon? No. Akeem Olajuwon, okay. that was his whole game, man. All right. That, that, is he as yeah. is he as good or better? of a passer than magic probably very similar but magic is better than him but very similar to me i think i think he's the the, the closest comparison to magic that we've ever seen is is lebron james so and I, I said that a long time ago man i called that I, one I agree with you and so the yep. interesting part of this pyramid is you can tell how much they put weight on assists because look at stockton he's the all-time assist leader he's on the fifth level 
Magic, yeah. who many would argue is a fantastic player, he's on the fourth level. And I would argue that LeBron's greatest strength is his ability to pass. His assist. Yeah, I agree. And, 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 and to me, that's a harder skill than rebounding. That's a harder skill, in my opinion, to do it really well than just pure scoring. Because, you know, you have to be able to have vision and be able to anticipate things. I mean, some of the, the passes that, you know, uh, uh, Magic did were freaking believable. Unbelievable. Yep. LeBron can do it too. And to me, that's that's an underrated skill. So that, that that's a great observation that you made is that this guy who, who did this article didn't really value assists as much as scoring, as much as maybe the defensive side the of defense. things. You know, correct. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. but assists, so, so if you look at skill. if you look at assists as the third leg of offensive skill. Right, yeah. Be, beyond right. you know scoring and, and rebounding. Well, rebounds not really an offensive. Rebounds score. more of a defensive. Yeah, defensive more of a defense. Yeah. But if you if you count it, you know, below offense, below scoring, then I can see why LeBron is there because LeBron is hardly the scorer that anybody is above him in terms of just a raw score. LeBron's not a raw score. He's a passer. Yeah. He's a creator. He's yeah. a He's, which, he's, which, which makes his accomplishment even more incredible because he wasn't ever known that in his, in his whole career was never known as a scorer. And yet he's the all time leading scorer now, man. So that, could, that just goes to show you how good this freaking guy is. As much no, as I, I hate agree, the guy. That's also, that's I, hate, also I, hate, I don't hate the guy never... personally. I just don't like him as a player. He just annoys me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's a great fucking player. Yep. So Because then you have Nash, who was a fantastic passer. And was probably a, a, a well, not probably. He's percentage wise was a better three pointer than LeBron, but just didn't shoot him in quantity. Uh, then you got Luca, who's really interesting to me that he's in here, right? I, I, if I'm not mistaken, he's probably the youngest player in this list. Yes. Right. Yeah. So yes. by by a long shot. And, Jokic and so is probably the next one after that. Jokic is after that because uh, he's the yep. below, below yeah. that. When, they're, they're similar when we get to our next topic, which will be the triple doubles, you know, Luca has a shot at owning that historically, yes. right? He's he's a yes. younger guy. So then we got Magic, we got the big O, we got Tracy McGrady and um, Pete Maravich. Anybody yep. there that you think should be higher or lower? I think Magic should be higher. I think LeBron should be higher. Um, Where would you I put him? Think, yeah, Two. I would put him in the third tier. I would put him in the third tier. I I would put them in the third tier. I put I would put uh, uh, Akeem in the second tier. I would put uh, Bird in the second tier. Um, I, I I'm okay with everybody else. I put Harden below uh, the third tier. Uh, he shouldn't be in the third tier. And Chris Paul, I, I don't know, man. You 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 believe that, that he should be in third? I, I I didn't see it, but I understand why I, your point. Anyway, yeah, I, I, I think he's I think he's a solid player, both offensively and def defensive. I just don't think he is. Like his skill, right, isn't really passing. His skill is controlling the flow of the game. Yeah, yeah, he he's a do that. He can do that better yeah. probably than anyone on this list. Yeah, he's but probably the, the truest point guard that we have on this list. Although John Stockton fans would have something to say about that, but um, well, but uh, yeah. Stockton. Well, it depends on how you define point guard, right? If point guard's pure job is to pass, then yeah. Stockton, Stockton's Stockton and, and Magic are the most purest point guards on this list. But if you from, want from some a, from offense, a passing standpoint. Yeah. correct. But if you want some offense from your point guard, then Stockton would fall short because Stockton. Yeah, but Stockton was a sneaky scorer, man. Well, he, he, he was. was. He just didn't do it enough. enough. He wasn't yeah, a threat. No one enough. was. No one was. He didn't need to because he had freaking Carl Malone. Correct. You know, he, he he's feeding Carl Malone. That's why Carl Malone's like number four on the list, I think, all time, wherever he is now. He's four or five. It's because of him. You know, this yeah. guy was an incredible freaking passer. Well, so he was, and I yeah. believe he's still the assist leader, if I'm not mistaken, in the NBA. He is. Right? A, he is the assist leader and the steals leader. Yeah, and I don't think his assist it, it'll never be caught. No, nor will his steals record ever be caught. Um. So anyway, he's underrated. He should be higher. But anyway, okay. by the way, we All should right. probably get through this list because we're running out of time, man. So get through it. As, <laughs> get through the other stuff. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So really quick, going through the the the, the fifth tier here. Just uh, so, just a reminder: Kawhi, Carmelo, Dwayne Wade, Garnett, um, Jokic, uh, Stockton. Why do I keep forgetting uh, Kirk Nowitzki? Oh, Thank Nowitzki, you. Nowitzki, Nowitzki. Yeah. I keep forgetting Nowitzki's name. Um, and then uh, you got Iceman George Gervin. You got Tim Duncan. You got Paul George and Damon Lillard. I look at this, and to me, 
I don't think Melo belongs in that list. You think he should be not even on that list at all? Right? Is that what you're in saying? Terms of, like, in should, terms of the other people, I, I think, well, put it this way. I think he's a level below the guys on that list. Yeah, I agree. I agree, yeah. but he, you know, so a lot of people forget means. how good of a scorer that guy was. He was a really damn good scorer because right. he could do it from every level, right? Um, and he was yep. hard to deal with because of his size. So um, the, but the one guy I'm standard. having heartburn with is Tim Duncan. I I feel like he should be higher. He should be higher. But the, you know, yeah. the thing is, we talked about this in the previous one of the, our, our previous episodes is that you know uh, Duncan is underrated, and he's underrated because of his. He's just an unassuming guy, and he played mm-hmm. for a small market, right? And, 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 you know, he had, you know, David Robinson kind of overshadowing him a little bit, you know, he had a, t- uh, uh, you know, not that Tony Parker was a bigger player than him, but you know, he, he had good talent around him. Right. But he's just a, a, a you know, a very low profile guy. And I think because of that, it hurts him. I, I think that's part of the well, reason why I, th- I, I think, I think well, I think Duncan suffers from the same disease that Jabbar suffers from. And that is, they don't play with joy on their face. They play like it's a lame. <laughs> Right. Yeah, because, that's a good call. It's a good yeah, call. Yeah, because because here's the thing. I mean, people are going to argue, but in a in a lot of ways, I felt the Warriors were a small market team back in the day because no one, no For one, sure. you, you'd, you'd have people asking you, "Where the hell is Golden State? Like, where do these where's, guys even? Play? Where's Golden like, State? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is Golden <laughs> State? Like, they wouldn't even know that. And Steph brought them up, but Steph is every bit as. I mean, I think Duncan and Steph are every bit talented, but Steph is more joyous. He does his little dance. He does his little things. Yeah. He's got his, so he wins people over. That's why he has so many fans, you know, because, you know, yeah, because people, he's got people personality. Like he's got a lot of personality. Yeah, personality. Means something. Correct. Yeah. You look at Duncan, you look at Jabbar and you're like, these guys look like they're miserable out there. Like they don't even want to play, yeah. you know? And I think that's yeah. what hurt Duncan. But I think Duncan from a skill perspective, man, I put him at least at the third tier. At the very lowest, I'd put him at the third tier. I think he should be two tiers. Yeah. I think he's one of the biggest offenses on this list. Uh, I watched uh, I the agree. Iceman I play. Agree. You know, the Iceman was a good scorer, but uh, I don't know if he belongs here. You know? Yeah, like, yeah I, I hear you. I hear Yep. Well, like, like if you're going to put Gervin here, you. I, if you put Gervin here, I'm like, where's Alex English? Where's – there's a couple of players. Where's um, uh, Rick Barry? You know, where, like, yeah, yeah. that's kind of, yeah. you get into that realm, you know? Uh, like, Wilt clearly isn't on here. Wilt was. We're, we're, yeah. We're, where's, 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 yeah, where's Wilt? And uh, 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 where's Bill Russell, right? Correct. So. Correct. So, so <laughs> I, Korean, I like this. Bill Russell, that, Wilt, like, what? That bottom yeah. tier clearly has today biased, right? It's the newer players. Let's stick yep. them in there. And then, like, the Iceman, they, it feels like, you know, I don't. You know, you can read through this article, um, and they talk about why he picked each player. I think Nowitzki is, is good there. I think Jokic is good there with the potential. Actually, I don't know if Jokic could even move up. Do you think Jokic could move up on this list? Absolutely. But, by the, but, but, but when it's all said and done, he's going to have the triple doubles record. He's probably going to have a few more championships under, under his ring. Uh, you know, uh, under uh, yeah, he's going to have a few more championships on his hand. Um, He's going to be. I I I, I, see, I I see him climbing up to where uh, Elajuan is. Honestly, really um, to the third he stays, tier. If, huh? he stays, if he stays healthy, absolutely. Well, that's as, a good as much check, as a, right? yeah, as a, yeah, as a much yeah, it is as much of a detriment he is on the defensive side. His his offensive side is un unparalleled. You know, we haven't seen anything like this in in history, uh, especially from that center position. We've never seen it. Correct. So, so speaking of triple doubles, we're going to kind of segue into my next topic. Last topic, yeah. Which, yeah, which was the triple double, you know. Um, and the reason I brought this up is because of Jokic. Uh, but what's interesting is, you know, you're like, he's going to be the triple doubles leader. But Russell Westbrook is currently the triples double leader. And he's nowhere on this list. He's nowhere on he anyone's is. list. Oh, yeah. You're talking about on the pyramid list. On the pyramid. Yes. Yeah, he's not on yes. the pyramid list. He's not. I don't. I don't. I'm really. Russell Westbrook is is interesting because I don't I don't know how well he's thought of in terms of like the the historical sense of the league you know as as a historical player but you know Russell Westbrook sits at the top with 198 triple doubles right um, below him is Oscar Robertson with 181 right so the big O everyone knows even if you didn't if you're a basketball fan you know who Oscar Robertson is you may not have watched yep. him play but you know who he is. 
Uh, below that, you got Magic, and then you got Jokic. So Jokic is at 130, right? So uh, yep. Westbrook's at 198. Jokic is at 130. Jokic is 29 years old, give or take. I think he'll soon be 30. Um, I think he will pass Russell Westbrook. That's, but what absolutely, I, he will. He but what will, I wanted sure. to talk about, what I wanted to talk about, part of this is I wanted to get your thoughts on: Is the triple double the same today as it was before? Does it mean more? Does it mean less now that the game? has less physical contact now that the game has been, you know, promoted more towards passing, promoted more towards shooting. Like is the triple double more of an accomplishment or less of an accomplishment in your opinion? Okay. Let me, let me put it this way. I think that the triple double back in the seventies, eighties, 90s was highly regarded because mm-hmm. it was so rare because not many people did it uh oscar robertson was one of the main guys doing it uh for the most part that's you know what he was known for until you know russell westbrook broke his record um you know magic johnson was a guy who also kind of started i would say that the, the emergence of magic johnson i think kind of started putting triple doubles on the map a little bit more because prior to that you know, it's just been Oscar Robertson. He's a, he's a player from the fifties and sixties, really, right? Yep, so, yep. so uh, you know, and a little bit in the, at, at the seventies, at the very end. But but Magic Johnson, I think, is the one who brought more of the awareness of the triple double and his flashiness and his passing. You know, and because he was a big guard, he could do everything well, right? Yep. So so from him, you know, he he's the one who I think kind of you know, put the triple double on the stage. And then, you know, you started seeing other guys started doing it, you know, Larry Bird doing it, you know, as well. Um, you know, and then from there you, you got, you know, the new, new kids on the block you know, that we have today, you know, Jason Kidd was another guy. We, we haven't talked about him. He should have been on that right. pyramid in my opinion. Right. Oh yeah, uh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Good he point. should have been a guy that he should have been on that pyramid. You know, again, I think you're right that the author of that article probably just didn't really value passing as much. And that's a great observation that you made on that. So, and I, I argue that passing is a huge skill, uh, as, as big of a skill to me as, as, as shooting to me, because, you know, you have to be able to see the floor and anticipate things and be able to get the ball in in a variety of ways to the guy. Well, let me, let me, I'm going to play devil's advocate with you for a minute here. Uh, Eddie. So when magic Johnson was passing, I agree. It was a skill because Magic Johnson had to run the fast break, draw the defense away from himself, find the open player, put the ball in a position to go. I would argue that the assist has lost some value in today's game because in reality, a large portion of what these guys do is attack the hoop and then throw it to the three point line for a three point shot. And I think that that is not a high skill. You know, when Jason, when, you know, uh, white chocolate, the old Jason Williams would run the fast break and he would be, you know, Pete Maravich, those kind of guys. I would agree that John Stockton, that was a skill because everybody's running down the ball and you have to find the offensive player slashing to the hoop. You've got to you've got to pinpoint a pass. But now right. in today's game, they attack the hoop and then throw it back out. Yeah, that's throw how, it out. Right. It's different. It's different. I know you're 80% saying. of the assists are made. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. The driving kick uh, uh, assist yep. is what you're seeing more and more of. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah you yeah. never saw that back in the day. If you threw it out, they were going to reset the offense and they were going to try to attack the hoop yeah. again. Right. You because know? they didn't have as many shooters as you have today, and we all Correct. we all have uh, we all have uh, Steph Curry to thank for today's NBA because he's the one. Correct. But not only did we have enough shooters, like back. I mean, obviously the three point line is plays a role here, but they weren't. They were just like that's not a good shot. You know, if you're shooting a 20 point, a 20 foot jumper, why would you do that when you can get in the paint? Like that was the whole objective was to get as close to the hoop as possible. And so to me, I would argue that the assist has has lost some of its luster, you know? Yeah, but but I think I think probably more. I I understand why, maybe because of the way the game is played and maybe, you know, the rules kind of play into it a little bit where it's a little easier to be able to, you know, uh, uh, do more offensive minded things now than in, back in the eighties and nineties. Yep. Cause you know, the, the teams were a little rougher on each other and they played yep. harder and you know, it, you know, they had to change some of the rules because people were getting hurt. Right. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think 
I think the 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 way the NBA is played today, you you see, it's not as it's not as a rarity anymore. The triple double isn't as rare as it was before, and I think because of that, I think it's not as valued as high as it was back when Oscar Robertson and Magic Johnson and Larry Bird were doing it, because there were only three that were doing it. Now you have a plethora of guys doing it, right? I mean, look at look at the list right now. If you look at the the top ten, you have one, two, three, f- uh, five of those in the top ten are current players today. Are, yep, five out five. of the top ten. I agree. Five of them. That's half. That's right there. So that tells you that 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 proves that 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 essentially supports my my point is that it's 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 become way more common, and I think because of that, it's not. It's, it doesn't. It's not as valued as high anymore. But does it does it does it affect a, a, a player's legacy? I mean, maybe uh, we, we, the proof in the pudding right now is Russell Westbrook. He's kind of the poster boy for that argument. He's he's a triple double king right now, and he was not even be seen on any of that pyramid. You know, again, this is it's his it's it's the it's, author's no, it's opinion, his, right? It's, but but it's, but but in fairness to the author of this article, I wouldn't have put Russell Westbrook in there either. Yeah, but that's interesting. Because you know that that tells that tells us that triple double triple doubles don't really matter that much. That's what it says. I mean, if it, it, but, but triple doubles before you know the eighties was very rare. <laughs> it didn't happen that much, man. Correct. You know? but, if, but you take two through what is it? Two through five. Those are all, they're all on the pyramid. Yeah, yeah, you're Oscar right. Robinson, Oscar, Magic, Magic Johnson, Nicola, Jokic, yeah. and LeBron James. They're yeah, and then Harden the and, and Harden and, and, and Luca eight and nine. Yep. They're on the list. Eight and nine. Larry Bird, Larry Bird at ten. Yep. So yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, it's it's a perception thing. I mean, Russell Westbrook. You were talking about joy. You know, he doesn't play with joy. I mean, that guy's playing angry all the freaking time, man. Yeah. But he's this ultra yes. competitive guy. He's an ultra competitive yes. guy. Jordan was the exact same way. Jordan played. He was ultra competitive, man. The, what made him appealing or endearing is that freaking tongue coming out. You know, you know, he's doing like freaking, you know, the dunks or the pass. You do something nasty, yep. have that tongue come out, right? And they had a bunch yep. of commercials with him, and he's a good looking guy too. So you know, he's yeah. he's appealing. So he's a marketable that all helped, guy. That all helped him. Yeah, it all helped. And then you know, getting and then Russell Westbrook, he just he has a scowl on his face all the time. He's just pissed all the time, you know. And 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 that says something. People can't really gravitate to that. But you know this what? what I'm, what, what also you know, I say, unless, say, unless you're a hoop, unless you're a hoops fan who appreciates ultra competitive guys, you're not really going to like Russell Westbrook unless you're one of those guys that yourself that you really appreciate that that and, that, and, that and, fire, and I'll be honest right? with you. And I think one of the things that watered down his his in particular was I remember several games where people are allowing him to get the rebound. People are you know they're yeah. they're, they're fudging yeah. the numbers for him yes. to get his triple double, and I think yes. that that. If you're a real basketball fan, you remember things like that. Like, that's cheap. Absolutely. Don't do that. Yeah. You know? Yep. I remember Strahan yep. when he was going for yeah. his sack record, you know? Yeah. And, and I'm like, come on, fell. man. He just fell yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you got to earn it, man. Like, don't, don't do that, you know? I'd rather yeah. you not have it than to get it that way, you know? Yeah. But but so that, that's where I have Russell Westbrook. But, and just quickly, because I know we're, we're way over here. Um, you know, Luka Doncic, you know, what is he, 25 years old, 26 years old? He's got Someone 76 say, yeah. triple doubles. 70 I think he's going to be the one that passes both Jokic and Westbrook. Yeah, assuming that everybody stays healthy, yeah, he, his trajectory is there for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, Jokic is I mean for, for the position that he plays, it's incredible cuz he doesn't have the ball, you know, he's a, he, he does have the ball in his hands a lot. I mean the, the offense runs through the guy, but he's not a point guard. He's a center. You know, he Correct. has to get the ball from somebody. So the fact that he's able to do what he's doing at the position he plays yeah. makes it incredible. To me, I, and that I, I, you know, so I agree. Anyway. Really quick before we end it on the yeah. triple double, what are so I have some thoughts here, but I just wanted to ask you, what are the two? What are the easiest stats to get in a triple double? The easiest stats I would say is probably re- rebounding. I think so rebounding. rebounding is the easiest. Okay. I, I yeah. think so. Yeah. So how would you? How would you? So let's go rebounds, points, assists, and blocks. How would you rank them? As far as easiest. Yeah, e- easiest to hardest. The easiest would be rebounding. Um, okay, now we're assuming that a guy that we're talking about has the skill set to shoot. Are we are we talking about that? Because we know Draymond Green can't shoot that well. He's not the greatest offensive guy, but he does have triple doubles, right? Well, so we're, we're, we're assuming that he has some offense. He doesn't necessarily have to some shoot. offense. 
Okay, he could be okay. a dunker. He could be a low post guy. He could he can score, right? We've got I would to say, I would say rebounding is first as the easiest. Second easiest is probably scoring, and then okay. third I, I would say the assists, and then uh, fourth would be a steal. Uh, I would say steal, and then a block. Yeah. Okay. That that would be your okay. And the the reason I ask is because I brought up a little bit of an article. You know, there's been four quadruple doubles in the history of the NBA. Right, uh, yeah, one by Nate Thurman. Yeah, Akeem, David yep, Robinson. Akeem, David Robertson, yeah. and the Nate only Thurman. guard on here is a guy named Alvin Robertson who played for the Spurs. Oh, in yeah. The 80s. Yeah, and he had 20 points, 11 rebounds, 10 assists, and 10 steals. And to me, that's an impressive number because, you know, the 10 steals is a hard thing to do. Right? Absolutely. He's the only guard on there. That's like, that's really, really hard. When you have steals, in, even in a triple-double, is like really, really hard. So I just wanted to throw that out for the audience. Just bring that up. I thought that was fascinating, you know. Well, uh, on, on another, uh, so I don't know if you remember this game that Draymond Green played about four years ago, four or five years ago. He had a triple-double without points being one of the, yes. the, the doubles. That was incredible. That's impressive, man. That's incredible. That's freaking I impressive. I agree. I think it was, I think it was uh, blocks. I don't know if it was assists. blocks, steals, and rebounds, and assists. I forgot which one it was with the blocks or the steal, but he had one of those being, uh, you know, the the, the, the double digit one, and then the assists Correct. and rebounds. That's what I'm saying. Was, that, I, I believe yeah. it was block assists and rebounds. That's what they were. I think that's okay. fascinating. You know, if you yeah. could just make five baskets, bro, you'd have a quadruple double. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. That's why I brought up the yeah. argument. Like, are we talking about that somebody is, who can shoot, right? Because <laughs> yeah, that is <laughs> that was, that was that the is poster great. boy for that argument. So. But hey, Tuan, man, we, we good topics, man. I thought this was a, a a good fun show that we did. We talked about the NCAA finals. We talked about the playoff picture, the upcoming playoff picture with the plans. All the teams have been already decided, and then we talked about this uh, article. That I think uh, it, it definitely conjured up some good discussion and some yep. you know uh, a, a good content for people to listen to. Um, yeah. You know, I'm sure that you, you're going to have your your opinions on who should be on that pyramid or not. And then yeah, the last thing about it. the triple let us hear it, people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to hear your comments. And the last one is the triple double, you know, whether it contributes to the player's greatness. So great show, man. Buzzer Beaters episode two. Uh, again, for those of you, um, you know, you can find this uh, sports related podcast such as Buzzer Beaters, which is the name of our show, as well as points on the board that uh, William Del Pilar runs. You can find it at grumblingsmedia.com. You can also find out Rumble, YouTube, under the profile Grumblings Media, as well as your traditional podcast outlets such as Spotify, Google, and Apple. All right, brother. Hey, great show, man. And uh, right. let's go love, cheer on the Doves. They're playing the Lakers yes. right now. And hopefully yes, we'll, yes. you know, next week when we reconvene, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully the Warriors will be better than 10. So we'll yeah, we'll, have, we'll, we'll, we'll see some of the predictions that we did today. See how that's looking. Exactly. All right, All right brother. Man. All, All right, 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 man. Have a good week, man. Later, man. All right, bye. All right. See you. Hey, everybody, this is Big John from Grumblings Media, and I just want to say thank you for watching our content. If you want to support our efforts here at Grumblings Media, just smash the subscribe button right here, totally free, or just go ahead and consume more of our great content. Click either one of these two boxes.